In 1989, RTE decided to launch an urban soap, following in the tradition of Coronation Street and East Enders. The first episode was an hour long and set in a fictional area called Carrickstown on the north side of Dublin. You'll never live it down, Ma. The front page and all, you'll be the talk of Ragnall Place. Do I look all right? You look great. What do you think, Dad? Embarrassing. I know Glen Row was at the height of his fame at that stage, and they had Glen Row and they had Bracken before it. So I think they were trying to get the polar opposite. We were definitely from the north side. Over a million viewers tuned in and were introduced to the key families around which the drama would unfold. We used to shoot it in Ardmore. We'd come into television. Just studio wasn't built in those days. And we'd come in here... Uh, and we'd get on a bus and they'd bring us to Ardmore and we'd rehearse in Ardmore and we'd shoot the interior stuff in Ardmore and then we'd shoot the exterior stuff in Drumcondra and it was directly on the flight path to Dublin Airport which was a great help because every three minutes you had an airplane landing and coming over and so we'd have to stop you see so you had to try and get the scenes in between the airplanes. One of the four scenes I remember doing, and I kind of set up the character, I think, in many ways, was uh, Barry coming into the house to his mother, and he brings in his washing. Hi, Ma. Oh, Barry, where did you get that awful tie in the photograph? The navy one with the crest I bought you for Christmas would have been so much nicer. Yeah, as you can imagine with the first series of the first episodes, so to speak, they were setting up the characters. So by showing Barry bringing in the washing and all, I kind of set him up as this kind of mammy's boy kind of thing. You stay for a bit of breakfast, No, you? Ma, I just brought the usual. Am I good trousers and cream short ironed? While Barry O'Hanlon was set up as the Irish mammy's boy and potential priest, Paul Brennan was the young man with an eye for the women, a role that he's still playing 20 years on. No, I'd rather walk. Have a word with you, Paul. Otherwise engaged. Can't you see I'm otherwise engaged? It was started off by the, the guys who started off EastEnders five years before, and EastEnders had been such a hit that they kind of went, OK, yeah, we'll go with these guys. So they were kind of coming over from London, from the East End of London, over to the north side of Dublin, and it was kind of near the twain with meat kind of thing. You know, it's a different idiom. We speak different, we have a different sense of humour, and different people. Do what your daughter says and stay out of it, please. Cheeky little... They eventually brought the Irish writers in, Irish storyliners in, and... Um, Irish producers in and kind of went, OK, let's kind of ground it. It took a long time for it to settle, but then you get the right mix, you know, stories, the length of scenes, the, the, the number of scenes, the, the characters, the actors, and all the elements come together and it clicks. One of my favourite things was in the early series. Myself and Paul, Tony, ran the marathon. So they had this whole idea of us training through the four series. If I remember correctly, I was pretty fit at the time. God be with the days. I was pretty fit at the time, so I was actually great, but it was great, you know? And um, the Sunday before the actual marathon, we shot some stuff along the canal and had the x-rays and they had the camera on the back of the motorbike and we were running along and went to another location. And it was all great, so the whole day shooting, inserts. Then on the morning of the marathon, which was a Monday morning, and the episode was going out that night, we shot stuff at the marathon, warming up with the numbers, the crowds, people going by, blah, blah, blah. And then like an aerial shot of everyone starting off kind of thing. So once everyone started off, we shagged off back to the mansion house and had tea and crumpets with the Lord Mayor kind of thing, you know? And then when the marathon was over, we wandered out two half hours later and oh, threw ourselves off the line. They rushed the footage back to RTE put it in with the stuff they already had, and they showed it that night on the TV. Oh, God. In the first series, we saw Rita Doyle struggling alone with her tribe of children, and it's not until the next year that her errant husband, Bella, comes back to Carrickstown. I got a call from Niall Matthews, who was then executive producer. I wanted to know would I come into the series. Terrific. And I wasn't too sure, because at the time, it seemed to be still trying to find its feet. Well, he said, come on in and meet me. So I went in and met him, and we had a talk. He said, look, Jim, the character, I break it down for you, he's a bit of a wanderer, right? He's been away, he's coming back, and he really can't settle down. And he's a sort of, he's not a nasty bad guy, but he's irresponsible and that, right? 
I said, yeah, come on, come on. He says, and the name? I said, what is his name? He says, Bella Doyle. I said, OK, I'll do it. He said, what? I said, yeah, Bella Doyle, magic name. Thank you very much. I'll do it. So I did it. I'm 20 years in diversity this year. Started when I was eight years old. I grew up, you know, like everyone has snaps of them as a baby. I've got a whole show reel of embarrassing hair. <laughs> well, Mrs. McCoy, this is it. it sure is. In 1990, Kay and Noel McCoy opened their refurbished pub, the setting for much of the drama of the coming years. Hey, Warren Lily. Turn him up, Joe. I'm here, Noel. God, it's going to be great. Not having to put my hand in my pocket for once. I know, I know, I know. But if I know, I know. You have a storyline, like at the moment we're in for five weeks and those five weeks are so intense, so you know when you're in, you can forget about everything else and that it's 20 past seven in the morning until, you know, whatever time at night time. So it's really, really hard work. Today I have uh, 11 scenes right on the trot, so you have to literally walk around with your scripts, you can't go because you know, you just know that you're going to be called, I'm going to be called now at any second, and we have to go down on the floor, and that's just the way it is. So it can be extremely, extremely hard work when you're in here, you know, and your time is not your own. You just have to be on call. Now, can I just ask... Bella may be back home with his family, but that didn't mean he had to change his philandering ways. He begins a fling with the local girl, Linda O'Malley. That's why I'll always be around you. Well, it was always a bit of a mug right when it came to women, always. It was a challenge to Bella every time he'd see a pretty girl. Do, 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 do. And he would be down that road and wouldn't care what the consequences were. Hey, what's all this? You're planning something I don't know about? Don't be so daft. These are for Linda. What are you on about? Linda O'Malley, she's back. Oh, is that right? Yeah, she's expecting. Linda O'Malley's pregnant? She's well on, poor girl. Some Galway fella. I think they're a typical, um, my dare I risk it, Irish sort of uh, relationship, is that it, it taking for granted, you know? I mean, he just took her for granted and took everything for granted, thinking everything is great. I'm the father. It was never anybody else. Just you. I have to go. Right. No, I'm sorry. Just take care of yourself, won't you? Realising Bella is a non-runner, Linda starts dating Barry. Always the soft touch. I see Barry as a kind of a good-hearted, a nice man who's unlucky in love. You know, there was Linda. She, <laughs> if people heard you talk about this, she was pregnant with Bella's baby and I took her in and the baby. Linda, wear this ring as a symbol of our faithful love. In, in 1992, Barry makes an honest woman of Linda, happy to pretend that baby Alice is his. But their happiness is short-lived as baby Alice becomes critically ill. Doctor. Doctor. What's gone wrong? Well, the heart isn't pumping enough blood to the rest of the body, you see. When death is inevitable, some parents prefer not to prolong the suffering and to let nature take its course. It is only a matter of time. That was a big strain on the relationship, as you can imagine. So that didn't last too long afterwards, after the baby died, and, and we split up and eventually got divorced. <gasps> Next week, same time, same place. The next year, Bella is back to his old ways and finding comfort in the arms of another woman. And this time, Rita finds out. It's time you all realise I want no part of you in this house. Just wait a minute, Rita. I am not budging till we have this out. Now, this is my home and I have every right to be with my family. That wasn't your family you were thinking about when you were running around with that lying little trollop. Rita, you're blowing this out of all proportion. It was just a few harmless meetings with a lonely little girl, that's all. And what about the others, the ones in England? God, this stupid business, how's he imagining things? Yeah, that's what I told myself. You can't 
go accusing a man just because he dolls himself up to go out with the lads. Uh, Rita. Or bring himself to touch you. Or look you in the eye. Hey, come on, Rita, don't put us through all this, will you? You're the one who put us through, Bella. It was nothing! Nothing! If I was to twist that knife in your heart, maybe you'd understand. Do you not realise I love you? Get out of me, sight. No. You are not driving me away from here, Rita. Do you hear me? Never. Gran, I better go in. No, no, leave them, leave them. If you don't get this stuff out of here now, I'll dump it on the street. No, no, come on. Don't say God another says. word, ma. So help me God, I won't be responsible. Stop it. If you don't stop it, I'll tell. You'll tell no one, Dora. Tell me father. Her father. She'll tell her father. Maybe she can find him. I hoard your man off with another owl. That rice is on. No! You've no one to tell, Dora. Because your dad isn't there. And he's not coming back. Because he's not left. Is that right, Suzanne? I think Suzanne was about... 11 or 12, I think, when Rita and Bella broke up. And there was a storyline where Suzanne ran away and she went to Bella's bedsit and a woman answered the door, Irene. Hello there. Can I help you? Is... is me dad not here? Your father? Isn't he here? No, he's still at work. Maybe I could help you. No. I want me dad. Look, what me... Suzanne was very upset by that and um, ran away and spent the night sleeping rough somewhere. Mm. So she did witness it. <laughs> in 1994, they spent money building this soundstage we're in now and soundstage B, A and B, and also they decided to build a street Fair City Street, so as that they could shoot in the street without going outside the complex, which meant that they weren't bothered by traffic or the public, or they could control everything. And by doing that, they could do more work. So instead of doing a half an hour a week, we did an hour a week. No, they're just going, I think just going into a car right there. Okay. Can you close your eyes for a second? Yeah, Cheryl, I'm, I'm kind of to blame for Carol. has created Carol's look. And my black eyeliner. Which we're just about to. Yeah. Ash kind of likes to do herself. Yeah, because it's... She's control freak. No, I just don't <laughs> like to have things stuck in my eye. She yeah. kind of wears brash clothing and brash... It's all... and big earring, you know, she's very OTT in general. Yeah. And so we kind of just went OTT with her makeup. Then it's kind of, we, we just we just like it, don't we? Yeah. And also, I play older than who I am. Exactly. <laughs> we age you with your makeup. Oh. Speak the devil. <laughs> Hi, Helen. Mm. Helen, this is Nicola. Nicola, this is Helen. In 1995, Paul is dating strong minded Nicola while sharing a flat with Helen Doyle. And as usual for Paul, he's not sure which way to turn. Helen and Paul shared a flat with Barry and uh, I think uh, that's where the romance blossomed. However, he manages to get himself engaged to Nicola. But all I want is a bit of extra time, that's all. The time to do what? Either you love me and you want to marry me or you don't. I thought you were going to bed age. Eh? He realised, I think, in the last few weeks leading up to the wedding, as I'm sure it happens a lot, that uh, he was marrying the wrong person and he, he loved her. He didn't love her as much as he loved Helen. You know, Nicola, She's everything I could possibly want. Except for one thing. I'm in love with you. So we did a lot of drinking. Beforehand, as you do, late at night. I've only just realised I've always loved you. You shouldn't have said that, Paul. It's not fair. Why not? Because you don't mean it. But I do! You're drunk. She obviously loved him as well, but she wouldn't let herself go the way he did after a bottle of whiskey. I suppose his life partner would have been Helen, and she was softer, but I think he was led by the hair. Yeah, when I had hair, yeah, up the aisle with, with Nicola, because she demanded that he, mar that he marry her, and, and he followed through. Did you get a puncture? No. So what kept you? I am. Um, I got delayed. Daddy, could you leave us for a minute, please? Paul, you know we've been driving around the block for the past 20 minutes. I'm sorry. I was beginning to think... Come here now, so let's just do this, all right? You weren't going to turn up, were you? There's a church full of people in there, and we've kept them waiting on you, so come on.
Paul does marry Nicola, but the love triangle between Paul, Nicola and Helen will be an ongoing story for many years. Do you, Paul Dennis, take... And do you, Nicola Ann, take this man, Paul Dennis, to be your lawful wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward till death you do part? I do. There is drama in the lives of Mags and Charlie when their son Tony arrives back from England. Tony, you see, found out that I wasn't his father. And this upset him greatly. Charlie's not my father. What? My real father moved to England before I was born. And he left Ireland. And he went to England, went to Liverpool, and he got into very bad company. And he owed the money. And he came back to Ireland, and they followed him over. So just give me the money, and I'll never have to see your ugly face again. What if I can't? Then your ugly face. Then eventually, outside Mackay's pub, up on the lot here, one of them catches him and produces a knife and uh, stabs him. Your old man has a business, doesn't he? Tells me he's doing real well. You leave him out of this. Oh, touched a nerve, did we? No, I swear. You go anywhere near my family and I'll... Tony! Hey, that's your old man now, isn't it? Let's go and talk to him right now. No. <laughs> and, of course, Charlie comes out of the pub and they're all upset and everything. Uh, it was a very good story. And I was very, very sorry to see Derek Kelly, who played Charlie's son, leaving the series because he was such a fine young actor, you know? Tony! Tony! <laughs> Yeah. 1996 saw Fair City tackle an issue that was to be a first for RTE, a gay love story which features a kiss between Owen and Liam. Well, almost a kiss. I saw you McKay's the other night. Oh, really? Yeah. You were with that uh, rep fella, you know, the drinks rep. Liam, isn't it? Yeah. Seems a decent enough lad. 64 pence, isn't it? Yeah. I must be very lonely for him all the same, you know, going around these his own from place to place. Sorry, what is all this exactly? What? I'm only making conversation, that's all. I don't think so. I think it's a, his own really gay conversation. What? Well, the answer is yes. I am what you would have probably called a confirmed bachelor, a puffter. I am gay, queer, bent as a threepenny piece. Now, any more questions? Pascal arrives, looking for a job as a barman in McCoy's. Yes? Could I see the manager? Is there a problem? I'd like to see the manager. Is that not clear? Well, maybe I could help you instead. My name is Mr. Mulvey. I'm here uh, for the interview. Ask not what your sweetheart can do for you, <laughs> but rather what you can do for your sweetheart. Another new character is ladies' man Leo, already on his second wife, Sandy, the nightclub singer. I think the core to Leo's character is the fact that he's honest. He's not a devious man by any means, you know. What you see is what you get. There's only so much a girl can resist. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Young Neve Cassidy is new in Carrickstown. She sets her eye on school teacher Barry, who never stands a chance against her schoolgirl charms. I was cast as Neve when I was just, I think I was about 19, and I was doing a show in The Project with Dublin New Theatre. I wasn't always a boring teacher, you know. Well, I don't think you're boring. <laughs> Have you just seen me then? <laughs> yeah, so what kind of things did you get up to? Ah, no, that'll be telling you. Well, I can keep a secret. Yeah, so can I. That's why my lips are sealed. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, that story, you would get a response from the punters, the viewers kind of in the streets, and they wouldn't hold back and let me know uh, what they thought of you or your carry on and that could be a good way or a bad way but with the the school teacher now the affair with the pupil kind of thing there was a bit of you know leave that young one alone or you'll get into trouble or you get her into trouble or whatever like you I mean so there's a bit of that going on yeah well uh, that's a uh, great news about the exam uh, she was going to buy for grinds and she must have had other kind of grinds on her mind it's a bit stuck there she came in as Neve's mother, and Neve at the time had been having um, a sort of sly flirtation with Barry, the school teacher. And uh, of course, I thought this was outrageous, outrageous. The school teacher taking such an interest in my daughter, who was doing all the, um, you know, I'm making all the moves, of course. You're my pupil. What you feel or I feel isn't important. 
don't care what other people think. That's easy for you to say. But it's my job, my livelihood that's on the line here. Now, I'm sorry if that sounds selfish to you, but there you are. I'm the one that's going to have to face the music. Because they'll say that I led you on. I took advantage of an innocent young pupil. And who am I to argue with them? Because they'd be right. Helen went away and went away to work in London and Paul went over after her and uh, secretly and he Listen, found her working in a hotel and um, one thing followed another, I think they had a night together and uh, she got pregnant. Helen, you're driving me crazy for God's sake, will you just give me a straight answer, will you? Okay, it is your baby, satisfied? But it doesn't change anything, Paul, it's over. But with Paul still married to Nicola, Helen tries to pretend that it is her new boyfriend, Mike's child. Maybe we can move you to the delivery room. Are you the father? Um, no, he's no. Right, you can wait outside, sir. Nobody knew that Paul was the father, and uh, she went into labor, and Paul had to bring her into the hospital. And the great thing about doing that scene was when he actually had to bring her into the labor ward, she was having the baby, and he wasn't allowed in That's because no. he wasn't down as the father. And Mike Gleason came in, who Paul didn't like, and he just passed by Paul and in the corridor, and he went in, and he held her hand, and Paul had to stand outside crying, looking at his, his baby girl being born when he wasn't there. And he couldn't say anything to anybody because uh, he was married to Nicola. This is the best day of my life. No, no, I Matters don't. become further complicated when Nicola gets pregnant too. You're going to be a daddy, Paul. I'm pregnant. And when Paul cracks and tells her about baby Rachel, the relationship finally falls apart. Rachel is my daughter. What did you say? I'm... I'm the father of Helen's child. Helen and Mike were getting married and Paul, drinking again along the bar, just decided this can't happen. And this is the woman I love. He's already been kicked out by Nicola and he went to hell with it. And he followed, went up to the church and it was a classic uh, graduate moment. May Michael and Helen always be true to each other. May they be one in heart and mind. May they be united in love forever. Through Christ our Lord. Helen. Helen. She ran from the altar and they uh, they didn't live happily ever after, but they did for a couple of years anyway. You go for me and your taboo. But One of my favourite characters of all time was Eunice, who was my mother-in-law, Joan O'Hara. I mean, she was just fantastic. And her character in Fair City, she was as mad as a hatter. So she was fantastic. She was one of my favourites of all time. And I just loved acting with her. Hiya, sorry I interrupt. Mm -hmm. Neve Cassidy has left school and is now working for Leo in his taxi office. And it's not long before she's causing trouble again. She felt grown up, so she wanted to look grown up. So uh, Leo appeared in Carrickstown. And he was married to Sandy at the time, which wasn't his first wife, it was his second wife. And Sandy was very glamorous and was a redhead played by the lovely Cheryl Bradley. And I think what Neve saw in, in Sandy is what she kind of wanted herself. So she made a play for Leo. And Leo had no problem playing back. Um, and it got very steamy for a while. You know something, Neve? I think you're the kind of girl that my mother warned me about. Yeah? Well, is that good or bad? Oh, it's bad. Very, very bad. And it ended up with poor Neve getting pregnant. And I think that was the reality check that brought her back to herself. That, re that made her kind of realise, actually, there's, there's no actions without consequences. So that led to Neve deciding to have an abortion. And finally, Bella gets some happy news and manages to be a good father that Christmas. He was having a very bad time. He was out of work. He had no money. All he, he had a couple of selection boxes for the children. 
He buys a scratch card and he's in the mall and he's standing under the Christmas tree with a little cherubic angel at the top of the right. And I think it's the last scene of that program because I think it was one of the most watched scenes on television that year, or over 10 years. Right? And he scratches his scratch and he wins and the camera comes up to his face and he, he just looks up at the little angel up on the tree, right? As if to say, thank you. And that was a very happy time. He was able to get bicycles and everything that for the kids. Ash. Yeah. You're going in and all you're doing is you're going to walk through into the kitchen and you're going to just put the kettle It's kind of yeah, just to yeah. be angry. And then he's going to follow you in. It's all in one camera yeah. in... Um... Carol and Christy, when I heard about it first as a possibility, when the producer mentioned it, I thought, hmm, I don't know. Uh, funny enough, Ashling and myself had been in the show almost as long as each other, but we circled each other. You know what I mean, we never actually crossed paths, not to mind swords. Uh, so I thought, I don't know, they, they, and yet, when you think about it, they're from similar backgrounds. We just committed ourselves to it, and it's working out quite well. See, she's gone out with a lot of really rough characters, so I think she sees a decent man, and she's going to go with that. Uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy all of the scenes with her because she's so sparky, so fiery, and then she can suddenly turn into this vulnerable kitten. It's great. I thought I was in the right, but Ali put me straight. I shouldn't think the worst of people. It's a bad habit. It's just, well, I don't think I've ever been with someone who was faithful or halfway decent to me before. So it might take a bit of getting used to. That's my line. It's because they are not obviously romantic material that it has the potential, I think, to be a love story. Oh, you really can't see through her, can you? Right, let's have a look at it from Pearls Walker. The breakfasts, the mugs of tea. She offered you a mug too, you said no. Oh, yeah, the three of us sitting around drinking tea and me feeling like a gooseberry. There's no reason to. I know our game. In 1998, we see the start of a romance between Suzanne and Damien, a relationship that will end in marriage years later. The way it developed was kind of very natural, and at that age, it was just great excitement every time we were in, you know, to do a scene. And great excitement when we had lines, you know, because we used to just run around the background. But if we got a line, it was all, oh, we got to say something this time, so. Did you ever snog anyone in the park? <laughs> no. You want? I... I don't know. You know, if you ever make a decision on it, I'll let you know. Hi. Oh. Lorraine Malloy begins dating Jack Shanahan, a doctor in the local hospital, and apparently a good catch. Jack, we're closed. No, I didn't come in for a bap. I said I'd be home. You can't go sneaking up on people. I want to talk to you. But there's nothing to say. Lorraine. Jack, let me go. I'm not holding you. No, but you're standing in my I way. I want to talk to you. Jack, let me go. For the love of God, Lorraine, will you listen for once? Jack? I've got a knife here. Do you want me to hurt myself? No. No, of course not. You won't. You won't listen to me. Is that it? Right. Jack, you're beginning to freak me out now, OK? You know something? Could have been really good for both of us. Are you all right? Lorraine, what's wrong with What happened? Talking up the beast. <laughs> you get up! Um, don't! Don't even think about it. See this guy here? This man here, this Dr. Shannon, he raped my daughter. This piece of scum raped my daughter. This swine. Right? You would. Right? Are you just it with your please, don't you? Just get off me back, will you? One of the biggest stories that year is the disintegrating relationship between Paul and Helen and its tragic conclusion. Where are you going? The humour lunch is gonna happen. Do you know what you never do any of the things that you promised, but when I remind you I'm a nagging old cow, is that it? Yeah, well you're turning into a right one, all right. Well, do you know what Paul they were right about us? Who's they? I should never have gone ahead with it. And what should you do then? I huh? should have stayed in the church with Mike. They just had a row and uh, Paul stormed off. 
as he'd used to do a lot of, and he still does actually, flounces out, out of the house and he went off and went into a bar and got chatting up this woman and she comes in, she catches him chatting up the woman and she leaves, he goes after her, jumps in the car and uh, they're arguing. Just drive me to Natalie's, right? Let me pick up my daughter and go home. Sick of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The next time you get part... I remember doing that because we had to... because they wouldn't... Smash, we wouldn't have us in the car when they had to smash. So they had four or five prop guys standing outside with the camera just over the bonnet of the car and the four or five prop guys with sledgehammers going at the window, to smash the window, and us two going like that. It was quite funny. You had to be there, but it was, uh, it was, that's my abiding memory of the car crash. It was Kira's last scene, Kira Carroll, who played Helen. And myself and Kira had become very good friends, and kind of, and we had, had a good working relationship. You'll take her off life support when you've said your goodbyes. Please take however long you need. It was very emotional because it was Kira's last day. So it was kind of saying goodbye to Helen and saying goodbye to Kira as well. So uh, it was emotional doing it, and the tears were real, I think, because we were saying goodbye to be mate, you know? Please don't go on. Please don't go on. Please. God, don't go. Oh, no, don't go. But as one relationship ends, another is beginning, as Maliki the priest tastes the forbidden fruit and falls in love with pub landlady Kay McCoy, recently divorced from Noel. I was originally asked to do it by John Lynch, who was the producer at the time, and uh, he told me that he was a priest, and I actually was reluctant, because I've played so many priests in my acting career, I don't know why, I really don't know why, uh, but he assured me that he was an ex-priest. But when I arrived and saw the script, he wasn't an ex-priest, and I was very worried about this. But he said, don't worry, it'll all change, it'll all change very soon. This was around the time when, you know, there was a lot of news breaking about priests having affairs and having children left, right and centre, not to mention the odd bishop or two. Uh, so it was very topical at the time. Kay. This can't go on, Malachy. I know. Then why are you here? I love you. Please, it's not fair. Do you love me? Stop it. Do you? You know I do, but so what? I'm sorry, Malachy, but how can we have any kind of future together while you're a priest? We can't. Then I think it's better that we don't see each other anymore. I can't do that either. I want to be with you, whatever it takes. What's that supposed to mean? It means if I have to leave the priesthood, I will. You'd be leaving for me. I'd be leaving for myself. You'd be leaving for Stop. me. Listen to me. I've gone over this in my head till I've gone nearly crazy. And I keep coming back to the same thing. I love you, Kay. And I want to be with you. Malachi. I've arranged to see Bertie Flynn tomorrow. I'm leaving the priesthood. You're sure? You're really, really sure? Come here. I'm sure. There are more affairs in 1999, and this time it's Harry Malloy who's at it when Dolores' friend Shelley comes to stay. Kind-hearted Dolores decided to help out her friend Shelley, and she felt terribly sorry for her. her. Her marriage had broken up and she needed somewhere to stay, so Dolores said, oh, come. But Shelley was uh, very attractive and very uh, Machiavellian. And Harry tried to resist. Uh, being the good man that he was, but eventually uh, he succumbed to Shelley and her wiles, and they had an affair. Eventually, anyway, Dolores found out about it and all hell broke loose, because she never thought that Harry would betray her. So why did you come? Why, Shelley? For this. Lorraine goes through the trauma of Jack's trial for rape. You drank a cup of coffee with him and had a chat? Not then. Oh, I beg your pardon. That was afterwards, wasn't it? Yes. After the sex? After the rape. 
First, he raped you. Then you had a nice cup of coffee. Is that what you're saying? It wasn't like that. And isn't it the case that you felt cheated? No, I was scared. And out of your confusion and your feeling of injustice, you decided to get revenge, didn't you? No. And you decided to call it rape. Isn't that correct? No, he raped me. No further questions. I think Fair City and all soaps actually have, have a limited but important uh, impact where social issues are concerned. I mean, you know, you're very limited in what you can do. We're, we're before the watershed. We're a half an hour for a couple of nights a week. But it does have a, perhaps not a responsibility, but it certainly has a certain Sorry. ability to comment on social, uh, social things going on. And that's come up quite a lot. In answer to question one, did Dr. Jack Shanahan sexually assault Lorraine Malloy? Yes. Yes! yes. The jury assesses damages at £150,000. Plus costs. Oh my God, I don't believe it. <laughs> and with that behind her, Lorraine finds happiness with her first love, Jimmy Doyle. Oh. Is it okay? Jimmy, it's gorgeous. I love this. Oh. Are you ready? Just try And when Malachi leaves the priesthood, he and Kay marry. The next big thing that happened to them was the adopting of Lorcan, who was um, Carol's son, who, who was a very troubled young boy. And uh, against Kay's better judgment, they actually paid Carol to sign the adoption papers. I wish I could turn the clock back, Lorcan. Not this again. Ah, please, will you hear me out? She'd given Lorcan up for adoption, well, for foster care when he was very young, because she couldn't look after him, because she had him when she was around 15. You might even consider moving back in with me. I don't know what else to do, Lorcan. I've never had a real home, like this one. And that's your fault, not mine. I was in it for eight weeks, and then I was out for a little while, and then they contacted me again. And they said, we'd like you to come back in. And then the character just developed, and the rest is history. After the disaster with Leo, Neve falls back on the old faithful Barry. And if there's somebody out there... When her world started tumbling down around her, it was Barry who was her, her knight in shining armour, came back and helped pick her up off the ground, pick up the pieces, and then they got engaged. I'm asking you to marry me. Neve. I, uh... No, 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 you don't have to answer right now. Uh, you can think it over. No, it's just I'm... No, no, there's nothing to think over, Barry. Of course I'll marry you. I'll marry you in the morning, if you like. Yes. <laughs> Though planning a marriage to Barry, Neve makes a play for his best friend, Paul. And once again, things end in tears. Paul wasn't married at the time, but Neve was engaged to Barry. I think with Paul, it was her first major love affair. While Lorraine and Jimmy finally make it up the aisle, disaster strikes the couple on their honeymoon in Florida, when Lorraine is killed in a hurricane. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord. May she rest in peace. Amen. Amen. So planned, it's definitely so planned. Anything can happen. Like, you do in so planned things that you could never ever do in real life. Two thousand and one begins with another controversial story for Kay and Maliki when Kay discovers she is pregnant. Yeah. So, how'd you get on with the doctors? We had a chat. And what was the diagnosis? Did you get a tonic? No. Kay, is there is there something bigger? Yes. Is it serious? It is. I'm pregnant, Malachi. Kay had been told long before Malachi ever met her that she, she couldn't have children. So when he married her, he, he knew this. Um, and so he wasn't expecting any children. The results show that the fetus has a chromosomal disorder. But so being so, it had to have complications. How bad will it be? I need to know. 
It's probable that it will be born blind, deaf, and with no sense of smell. She decided to terminate the pregnancy, and that led to the whole uh, can of abortion worms opening out all over the screen. And uh, it was a very, very fascinating story to play. In this instance, he was so enormously overwhelmed by the possibility of becoming a father that he couldn't contemplate for an instant this now being taken away from him, this gift that he never expected just being taken from him, and he let that colour his judgement. Do you not think I'm suffering this loss too? I'm feeling it just as much as you, maybe even more, because I was the one who had to make the decision. That's the whole point. It was my baby too, but I didn't get to decide. I didn't have a say, and nor did my child. Maliki never comes to terms with Kay's actions, and they eventually separate. Leo has the record for Carrickstown marriages, and Pauline becomes wife number three in 2001. I give you this ring as a token that I will love and honor you always. Pauline, she was the big love of Leo's life because um, she was a financially independent woman, which is very, very attractive to Leo because there's also this little grain that's running through Leo's character where he's a bit of a tightwad. So that was very attractive that she would be financially independent. But Pauline was a very, very uh, emancipated woman, but also extremely sensual. So. It was, a, it was a terrific package. Come on, break it up there, Mary. Still reeling from the death of her daughter and Harry's infidelity, Dolores finds comfort with the dashing Frank. I am an old-fashioned guy. Dolores was doing all sorts of things to kind of um, get herself back together again, if you like, and decided to get the house done up. And this very suave painter came into the house who had kind of a movie star thing going on about him, you know, kind of Clark Gable looks, and he had worked in a, a circus as a ringmaster, and he started to come on to her a bit. Excuse me, can I have a quiet word? Oh, hi, hi. Might as well, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Dolores, what's going on? Harry, it was nothing. This friendship developed, and eventually, uh, she, uh, she went with it and had an affair with him. Will you stay with me tonight? But you said you didn't want anything to start between us. I just don't want to be alone tonight. She kind of felt justified, I think, because she had been betrayed, and I don't think she ever intended it to go very far, but it did become an affair, so, you know, there were consequences. Frank. Huh? Frank. Come here. You have to go. Do I? But at that stage, she had decided she wanted to, to break away from Frank, that really Harry was the person she wanted to be with. Dolores, what's this all about? You've been avoiding me for weeks. Frank, I'm pregnant. Promise me you won't say anything. Nobody knows about us. I want this baby to be Harry's. But what if it's mine? I don't want any trouble. Harry and I have been married for years. So? And you and I, we were just together once. I don't want to lose my marriage. Then why am I here? To stop this. There's no point in guessing. This baby is Harry's. That's what you want? Yeah. But the big story of the year, and the biggest ever for Fair City, centred around crime boss Billy Meehan, who married Carol with only Lorcan suspecting what a psycho he was. She was with Billy because I think he was exciting and he was dangerous, and I think they had a very strong natural chemistry. And uh, she's edgy, so I mean, she attracted edgy, but she attracted danger more than just edgy. Um, I think there's probably a huge sexual attraction. Um, you know, he had power, she liked the bling of it all. Um, he was fun, it was exciting. But then, you know, the other side was he was violent and he was dangerous. You all can help me! No! I tell me! I tell me! You all can help me, Carol! Ah, no! Is that it? Ah, 
I don't hear you! No! No! No one can help you! Dreadful things happened to her. He had an affair with her best friend, her bridesmaid. <laughs> You're a saucy little twat, Tiana. It's only because I care about you, Billy. Wouldn't be like that with anybody else. Yeah, sure. Well, you have to get the best out of me. I got tiptoe off now. We need me rest. Why'd you always do that, Billy? What? When you want something, you know, you're nice to me. And then when you get it, you treat me like a... Slapper? Because that's what you are. That's what I like about you. You know what you are. He beat her up when she was pregnant. She lost the baby. Uh -huh. Carol! Carol! She's been sniffing around me ever since she laid eyes on me. Laying her on a plate for me. You haven't actually been fulfilling that role now, have you? I don't believe this. You're screwing around with my best friend. And it's my fault. She's a slut. And so are you. Well, watch what you're saying. How long has this been going on? The pair of you disappeared at the wedding. Thought you were sorting out the cake or something. You weren't, were you? You little shit! You were giving her one of my wedding day! Oh, I want you! I don't take that from now! I gave you everything! I gave you this place! A car! Everything, Carol! But I wasn't enough for you! Oh no! Never enough! Oh, give me your shite! You can have it back! Because I wouldn't touch it, you dirty lying bastard! You. Shut up, I told you! No, I won't. And when my child's old enough to understand, I'm gonna tell him what a dirty little shit you are! I told you, shut up, girl! And they're never gonna see him! You're never gonna see him! <laughs> <laughs> That was horrendous. I mean, that was really gritty stuff. That was probably the grittiest stuff I've seen in Fair City. That way, if you know what I mean. You know, violent, violently. And I think we only shot it once. And I'm glad we only shot it once because it's very hard to shoot those kind of scenes over and over again. Number one, you lose the freshness of the scene and the momentum of the whole scene, you know, because it becomes too technical. So if you can get it in one, it's always easier. Number two, it's it's very disturbing to have to go into that kind of stuff over and over again. It's because it's 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 hard, you know. It's um it's ugly, you know. <laughs> it's obvious you can't be trusted. I think I'm gonna put a big B right there. The final scene was Billy's actually about to rape her. I told you, you're going nowhere. And uh, Lorcan comes in. It's always the famous scene of him walking in. You see the feet coming into the apartment, going down the stairs. And I'm on the ground, and Stuart Dunn, who's playing Billy, is on top of me. Oh, yeah. But I'm going to teach you a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, if it isn't the little bastard son. Fucking get out now! <laughs> Come to watch, have you? <laughs> Fur away, kid. You wouldn't have to pull. And uh, next thing, the golf club gets swung up. And uh, <laughs> boom, that's the end of Billy. <laughs>《In 2002, Ray O'Connell's son Mondo comes to Carrickstown looking for his father. — When I started to play him, he was uh, kind of a teenage delinquent running from his mother, kicked out of his own house. So I came to Carrickstown, you know, looking for his dad, who he hadn't seen in, in years. Uh, arrived at the garage one day and said, uh, how are you, dad? <laughs> and that was him in Carrickstown. Not even allowed to spoke in the arse. Mondo quickly begins a relationship with the young Kira Cassidy. I'm taking the day off. Anyone interested? Yeah, I am. <laughs> it's mad. Uh, the amount of people who don't know what it's actually short for. It's short for Raymond. Uh, so you know, Raimondo. Uh, when I when I read the name, I kind of wanted to ask them to change it because I thought it was crap. But 
I kind of I've come around to it now. I I, I think it's cool. Oh, right, Baby right. Jessica arrives, and Dolores is letting Harry think the child is his. Dolores had lost her beloved daughter Lorraine when she went away in her honeymoon. She had been killed in a hurricane, so she had buried her beautiful daughter and had, you know, hadn't really fully recovered from that either. You know, so the idea of having another child was partly appealing to her, you know, even though the circumstances were pretty devastating. The Doyle girls are now all grown up and very different people. What the hell are you doing? What, what, what the hell are you doing just walking into my flat? <laughs> Yvonne, oh God. Um, yeah, Yvonne, what can I say about her, really? Um, herself and Suzanne just really, like, they just really hate each other. And um, every script I get, there seems to be something new that you're just going to go, oh, uh, they're never going to go back on track, are they? Suzanne actually is his favourite. But um, the one he really is concerned with is Yvonne, and he gets very depressed and very broken-hearted when she acts up and decides to throw a mobbler. She went into depression and she went on to drugs. And her, she had sort of this schizophrenic um, existence. I didn't set out to hurt you. Or anyone else, I just... I just wanted everything to stop. Yvonne. No matter how bad things are, you always have us love, right? In three, two, one, action. I brought Renee over last Sunday so that she and Brenda could talk. What did you talk about? The day Floyd died. Let me guess. It made matters worse. They told you it was a bad idea. So many things have developed over the six years that I've been in the show, and, uh, and it's all coming to this point where uh, he's, he's, he's up for murder and uh, will he or won't he get off? Eddie, am I still leaning in, or are we now set in this position? Only in Fair City would you get a story like this. When anybody asks me, so what are you doing? What's going on in the soap? I go, well, my, uh, my, my wife in the show is uh, having a love affair with her half-brother, as you do. He's dying, and I'm going to murder him, and then we're going to have a court case about that. And they go, wow, that really is soap, isn't it? I go, yeah, yeah, it is. How would you describe Mr. Brendan Daly's relationship with the deceased? Hostile. They weren't exactly drinking buddies. Would it be fair to say that your original statement was influenced by your partner's emotional state? No. I'm only saying that Dr. Daly had every reason to be angry, but I never once saw it cross over to his treatment of Floyd. The family are split. Obviously, he was the one who, who injected him, who, who killed him in the end. Um, so it's not easy trying to convince the parents of, 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 uh, of Floyd Phelan um, to be on his side, as much as his wife loved him. I mean, he really has everything going against them. Thank you very much. I think that's a wrap. We're here again in the morning. In 2003, Mondo and Kira grow up fast when Kira becomes pregnant and gives birth to their daughter, Juliet. I am. Mondo and Kira were innocent teenagers. Um, you know, she she'd be doing her homework sometimes and Mondo would be there and they were kind of getting intimate and getting close and eventually they were doing the deed which is mad because I, I can't believe it that, you know they were going to school school age and uh, they were yeah doing the bowl thing I'm not going why not because there's nothing wrong with me well we let the doctor decide that shall we I'm not going and you can't force me I'm not letting this go Kira. <sighs> mom please no, Kira. Please, Mom, please don't. I know what's wrong. Mom, I'm pregnant. Kira got pregnant at 14, and of course, Gina was up the walls and, you know, praying for miracles and every sort of thing. And, and of course, it was all Mondo's fault. It wasn't my daughter's fault. Nothing to do with her at all. She's I remember doing that scene because uh, we actually had the we had a three day old child at the time to come and play baby Juliet, baby Aaron actually played baby Juliet it was a boy, and 
I just remember, you know, having the child and it just helped with the performance as well. Um, and how they got the umbilical cord as well. They used uh, empty sausage meat, which is creative. Oh no, look what we did. Look what we did, isn't she beautiful? Yeah. Just like her mother. The situation isn't ideal. He was living in a bedsit with Ray, uh, a horrible little bedsit, and then moved into a more horrible little bedsit to make his home with uh, Kira. Kira, why don't you get up and make us some coffee? Because I'm tired. I'm only you should have come home earlier. Couldn't. It was busy. Yeah, good night. That's where the beginning of the end was then for Kira because that's not really what she wanted. She wanted a proper upbringing for the child. And then sadly, she left with the baby to go to her Auntie May's house in England. I'm your dad. And you know, dads and daughters. And that's something special. And nobody can ever touch that. What the, the writers were doing there were kind of turning the stereotype around a little. So it, it was one of those rare stories where the fella sticks around and tries to do right, um, which I thought worked really, I thought it worked really well. Um, Laura and Louise are here. They want to give her a present. Just give me one more minute. The public really warmed to it, um, you know, and especially after that scene as well. Um, the amount of uh, text that I got at the time, you know, oh, Jesus, I was bawling, crying, watching the telly last night. Um, yeah, because it really was a nice, a nice little scene. While Kira breaks up her family, Renee Thielen's adopted daughter arrives looking for the mother that gave her away when she was young. This is Renee. I think it may have been Heather after her adoptive father passed away, went in search of her of her of her real her biological mother, and it was the, the a very very tender story of the two of them coming to to meet each other, and and that was a wonderful story. My biological father, I assume he's not your husband. No. He's someone I knew when I was younger. Do you keep in touch with him at all? No. No, I haven't seen him since... Well, since all this happened. Huh. I just wondered what he was like. Nice. He was nice. What's his name? I'm, I'm sorry if this is difficult for you. I... I don't know his name. I met him at this dance. Right at the end. My date had gone off with someone else. I was drunk. It was, it was almost a mutual thing because Renee was looking for Heather and Heather was looking for Renee, as it turned out. And it was very emotional. I mean, we actually, it was a very emotional scene that we had when we got together. It was lovely. But Renee didn't tell anybody, didn't tell Christy, didn't tell Eunice, Christy's mother, and, um, and didn't tell Floyd, her son. So that caused all kinds of problems at a later stage because when Heather met Floyd, they didn't know they were half brother and sister and Renee should have told them. <laughs> During the time when she was getting to know her mother again, she met this very um, charismatic young man um, who happened to be Floyd, um, who ended up being her half brother. And they had kind of started, you know, flirtation and a bit of, you know, uh, not a liaison or anything like that, but they, they were definitely really attracted to each other. Christy, Eunice, Farah, this is Heather. Hello. <laughs> Hello. 
Floyd. This is Heather. Champagne, Heather? Yes. Champagne? Sorry. Uh, relax, it doesn't matter. Uh, Farrah, give us a hand with these glasses, will you? Floyd? Floyd. It's nice to meet you. I'm Heather. I see Floyd and Heather very much as a, a Romeo and Juliet story. It is a, a story of passion, of intense love, of a situation, you know, of most difficult situations, but the family can't have them together. They can't be together, yet they want to be together, which is incredibly sad because they truly loved each other. You know, they were the loves of their lives. Renee was disgusted. Renee was absolutely disgusted. And she couldn't tolerate it. You know, she really didn't. Realising the relationship can never work, Heather leaves for England. How could you leave without telling me? If I told you, you'd have tried to come with me. Yeah. Well, either you stay. I'm coming with you. <sighs> Try and fix things up with her name. She's really hurt. You have to let me go. Please. This is hard enough. Let her go. I can't. You can. With wife number three gone, Leo's life is turned upside down when a holiday romance follows him back to Carrickstown. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Will I tell him I'm staying here? Well, he here? Well, I have nowhere else to go. I do have some money, but not much. It will be all go if, if I go to the hotel. And my family wouldn't be worried if they knew I'm staying here with you. I do like you so much. Well, okay, yeah, uh, well, I suppose, yeah, yeah. Just just for one night, okay, so uh, just till you get till you get yourself organised. Thank what, you. Uh, you know, he fell for this woman and then didn't realise that. Like, here now is a completely different kind of a person to Pauline. And this woman wanted something and she was going to get it no matter what. Yeah, well, you were supposed to be with me, right? Mm, and you were supposed to be with me, but no. You start talking to this other woman and make me look stupid. Yeah, well, she went after five minutes. You stayed with him for nearly an hour. To teach you a lesson. Yeah, drinking his drink, behaving like a floozy. And I do it again if you don't show me the respect. Oh, God. Oh, oh Lana, Lana, Lana. It didn't take me. Okay. Lana, you're the sexiest woman I've ever seen. I'll prove it. But the most dramatic story involves abusive husband Marty Halpin and wife Tess's belief that he has changed, despite warnings from her son Damien. I am confused because the man I fell in love with a lifetime ago is back. He's changed. Well, people like that don't change. <laughs> but he was right about you all along, wasn't he? And he is not a child anymore, Marty, do you understand? He won't hide in his bedroom crying while you kick and beat me. Not anymore, do you understand? He will sort you, he will sort you good and proper if you so much as lay a hand on me. <laughs> Get out, you bastard! Get out! Get out! 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 And don't you ever come back here again! Shut up! Shut up! Oh, oh just God. shut up! Shut oh, up! Oh, Jesus, Mary! Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! Oh, whatever happened to Damien? Oh, oh no! Oh. Mom? 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 Mom! Oh, Christ! Mom! <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I joined the community of Carrickstown five years ago, uh, playing Seamus McAleer. 
And we're talking about 2004, you know, the boom was at its height. So the idea of being a millionaire and being a property developer and being a tycoon and all, it was kind of currency at the time. So I kind of saw myself in that sort of mould, you know. Three, two, one, action. You've got people who really believe that you're, you're rich, you know what I mean? Well, if you're an actor on television, people believe you're rich anyway, which, as we know, is a complete fiction. Uh, but... Uh, but there's also people who think because you play a rich character that you're wealthy. And then there's a lot of people attracted by the, by the power of wealth. He's a totally lonely man. I mean, all he has is his money and his power and his quest for more money and more power. But really, he really hasn't got much in his life, you know. Stand by to rehearse then, please. Three, two, one, action. Mr. McAleer, this isn't a hotel. You can't just come and go. I'm not an invalid. No, you're going to discharge me, because either way, I'm leaving. Cos, uh, we'd like to go one more time. By 2004, Barry was now living with Sorka, a teacher in his school. His relationship with uh, Sorka was uh, going along. The scene began on very well, very happy. She, I think, looking back at it and looking at it, like, I don't know if she was as committed to him as he was. It's a whore, like, I mean, so that was a problem there. Uh, hello there. Hello again. Oh, you know each other? N not by name. Oh, in that case, this is uh, Ross O'Rourke. Yeah, nice to see you again. Take a seat. Thanks. Give him a couple of days, see if he's up to it. Fine. Everything okay? Uh, me? Oh, I'm fine. It's just I get this way before giving a class. Then I'll interrupt you no further. See you later. Yeah, okay. Every time he got close to happiness, something happened and he was shake around again and then he'd have a start back at the bottom again and go right through it again up the hill again like you know what I mean so there was that kind of thing and I think with the Sorka story they, they, they had it that this was this was it Sorka begins an affair with a young pupil Ross and Barry is the loser once again down in the gutter are you he's only a kid for Christ's sake and you told me lie after lie day after day isn't that right it wasn't like that every time I was kissing you all you were thinking about was when you could see him again no. isn't that right please and then you needed a good hot session with me before you could hack a weekend away with boring old Barry. Isn't that right? Well, and I then it goes downhill very rapidly. He accidentally ran over Ross in the car one night. And there's a whole lot of stuff happening. And this culminated in him having a breakdown. And I remember that story, you know, I say the breakdown in particular, because it was quite intense at the time now, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it was quite a heavy trip to go on. What do you do to pass the time in this place? Read. When Barry is in hospital, he meets up with Annette, an alcoholic solicitor, and they become close. No wonder everyone's cracked. You don't want to go saying that in front of the rest of them. It might upset them. Here we go. Great. Making sandwiches all around. Mm -hmm. I'm okay, thanks, boys. Jimmy Doyle is moving on and getting married to Robin. It looks like the stuff that came out of that Skoda last week. What do you want to die for? Well, I have to fit into my wedding dress, Jimmy. A mechanic with an eating disorder. <coughs> did you go to the doctor last week? What? Of course I did. You don't mind me checking, so? What? I'm going to call the doctor and make sure you went last week. Do you not believe me? Yeah, hello. Could you put me through to Dr. Brendan Daly and carry... Jimmy, stop things? it! Jimmy, stop it! It's confidential, Brendan! Yeah, and I tell him I'm your fiancé and that I'm worried about you! That you've been lying to me for weeks now and I can't help you because you won't let me! Please, just stop it, OK? I didn't go. I didn't go, all right? And I promise to love, cherish... The marriage goes ahead, but it's never really a match made in heaven.
Ross recovered from the car crash and while babysitting for Harry and Dolores initiates a tragic storyline that leads to three deaths in Carrickstown. Colour coming back into her cheeks. Can you see it? And her breathing is. She taken tablets, e tablets that have been left by babysitters. Um, they they went to great lengths to, to get these people in London to make a, a life size figurine of Jessica and everything. It was very eerie and strange. You know, uh, doing scenes with this doll. She was in a coma. In the hospital. Um, and it was touch and go, but looking very bad. So there was there was a period of hope, if you like, and there was you know that desperate hanging on to hope, and eventually the devastation of her of her losing her life. Nurse, what's happening? Please wait outside. Get Doctor Kinsley and get a crash trolley in here. Yeah, but I want to stay. Please, please, it's best if you wait outside. I'm afraid it's only a matter of time. Oh, Jesus. No, don't you say that. Tell him, Harry, say something, Harry, please. Tell him. Tell him. How long? Tonight. <gasps> Maybe tomorrow. Oh, God. Oh, don't. Don't let this happen again. <laughs> How you work your way through death, death of a child, particularly. Um, those are huge issues for both of them and I think it's very interesting how it can either pull people together or or create a chasm that neither can fill for the other. Just a few more minutes Harry please just a few more minutes. Dolores you have to let these men do their job now. It's okay. Now. No no it's not okay. Harry then uh, was so angry with with this boy he went after him and and he wanted to inflict some damage you know he wanted him to know what he had done you killed my daughter no no look 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 i didn't i didn't even know i lost you were in my house that night weren't you it, it was an accident i didn't even know okay just, just back away don't tell me to back away look man i'm sorry i'm sorry okay i didn't put that put that thing down you know what you done to us? She was three years of age! Oh, yeah. Harry Scott! Enough! <laughs> Not enough. The fact that he had taken somebody's life was too much to handle. And then there was a court case coming up about that he was possibly going to go down for murder and he decided that he just couldn't face it. He just couldn't face it and it all, it all got on top of him. And Dolores, I suppose, so lost in her own pain, she wasn't able to salvage um, him, you know. So he committed suicide. So then she had that tragedy to deal with. I think I love you. In 2005, Heather returns from London, now married to Brendan Daly, a doctor. But it's not long before Floyd lets the cat out of the bag. What's on your mind? Your wife. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Before you came along, Heather was with me. And you know something? We were in love. We were crazy about each other. Ultimately, he is absolutely in love with her, but he was always a bounce for her. He was never the most important element of her life. I'm sorry. Well, maybe the real reason why we're back here is because you still want Floyd. He's always loved and loved as hard as he possibly could in this story, and he was caught between a brother and a sister whose bond and love was much stronger than he could ever offer. Carol's son, Lorcan, marries newcomer Ali, a tough girl from the wrong side of the tracks. He turned out all right, didn't he, Lorcan? Yeah, he did, Carol. Do you consent to be my wife? I do. She's from Ballymun, and she grew up in the flats. 
Um, her dad kind of exited the picture early on. She's got about five siblings. She's the eldest. So she kind of grew up looking after all of the siblings. So in some ways she's really mature, but in others, she kind of left a lot behind. She left school behind at 13, and that's something that she does, she's a huge chip on her shoulder about. Excuse me, would you have a few cents, please? And another new character, the homeless Cleo Collins, arrives in town. Cleo? I did an audition for the part of Cleo. I auditioned previously, um, the year before, for the part of Ali, and didn't get that audition and completely forgot about Fair City. And a year later, I got a phone call offering me a six-week part, and I had just started sixth year in school, so leaving search year. The kind of parts that I had gone for were sort of girl next door, sort of um, the girlfriends, the pretty little girlfriends to come in and play. So I was assuming that I was going to be someone's girlfriend, so I went out and got my hair done and got this script, and the first line that I read when I opened the script was, spare change, mister. Could you spare a few euro? Sorry, no. Please. I haven't had any breakfast. She came in kind of to wreak havoc with Dolores' life. Dolores started working in the shelter, doing charity work, and Cleo arrived in down the stairs, soaking wet because it was lashing rain outside, asking for a bed, and Dolores was all, all kind of feeling sorry for her, and as she was, um, and gave her a bed. And then eventually, after a couple of nights of staying in the shelter, Dolores decided, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take her and I'm gonna look after her because she's, she's young and she's out in the streets on her own and, and doing the kind of, the goodwill thing. And took her in and then Cleo robbed her blind about three times. <laughs> In 2006, after many long years of marriage to the solid but unexciting Christy, Renee gets her head turned by the smooth-talking Bob Charles. Christy, I'm Bob. Delighted to meet you. Thanks for having us over to dinner like this. Hi, you're very welcome. The synopsis of Bob that I was given was that he was somebody who had been living on his wits most all of his life um, outside of the country, either in the UK or in New York, and had grown up on the streets in a way um, where you've got to graft and where you've got to be on your toes and very alert and very aware. And some days you win and some days you lose. An incredible evening. You are an elegant and a beautiful hostess. I hope you realise how lucky you are. She wasn't attracted to him at the beginning and there was no, like, it wasn't intentional. I mean, poor Renee, you know, she just found herself suddenly infatuated by this man and uh, he was exciting, where Christy was boring. He wore business suits. Christy wore multicoloured jumpers with all kinds of designs on them and suddenly she saw this man and she fell for him and he fell for her and they fell in love. I'm so glad we're together. Eunice had seen Renee and Bob kissing in the beer garden at McCoy's. And she kept this information to herself. She wanted to give uh, Renee a chance to get out of the relationship and not break Christie's heart. You're with him, aren't you? The window salesman? Yes, I was with Bob last night. Oh, look at you. To lie to your husband and spend the night in another man's bed. I love Bob. And you just stopped loving Christy one day, is that it? No, no, it's not like that at all. I tried. I really tried to keep away from Bob. Oh, I'm sure you did. No, I couldn't. I love him. I love him. And I want to be with them. And I will. There's a lot of women out there who have said to me, you know, Christy's lovely, but he's so boring. You know, I can understand why Renee would go for, for Bob, because he is that bit of excitement, and that little bit of danger always has an excitement towards it, you know? I am back, finally. What's the matter? Has something happened with Sandra's ma? No, she's fine. Christy is a man who had a simple ambition in life, and that was to marry Renee. That was it. He had the, it was all, all of his energies were dedicated towards marrying Renee. And when he finally got his dream, uh, much against his expectations, that was it. His ambitions were over. What is it? Christy. I didn't think I'd be telling you this in the middle of the shop, but I'm leaving you. You're leaving me? Yeah. Ah. Why are you 
you leaving? What have I done? Oh, no. No, Christy, I haven't done anything. I've fallen in love. Fallen in love? I'm sorry, Christy. I don't want to hurt you. I'm going inside. I'm going to live with... with Bob. It's... it's Bob, Christy. I'm sorry. Say something. <laughs> I'm sorry, Christy. I really am. I'm so... I'm so sorry. Christy was left standing in the shop, shaking with emotion, not knowing what had just happened to his life. The floor had just fallen out from under him. I think that in that one scene, it was possible to see his heart breaking. Yes, well, the ambitious Orla does well out of the rich and powerful Macaleer. So do you like it? Yeah, it's a great penthouse. What'd you ask? It's yours. What? It's yours. <laughs> You're joking me. I'll have the paperwork for you in a couple of days. You're serious? I just wanted to show you how much you mean to me. Oh, my God! I can't believe it! Oh, Seamus! <laughs> McAleer's relationship with Aura was very cool. Um, quite commercial, really, in its arrangement. Okay. But nice. essentially it was an arrangement whereby he looked after her financially and she serviced him. It was as simple as that, really. I asked the question when I got the script to say, to ask what, what, what does Orla see in McAleer? And, and at the time, somebody said to me, you know, just think of Charles Hawhey. And I was like, I think of Charles Hawhey? Yeah, you're just attracted to his power. So that was initially the attraction. Then she kind of grew to care about him, but it was essentially money, that's all it was. But then, when she deceived him and started going out with a younger man, and uh, also then he, he became very, very, very cruel to her and manipulated her to lose her business, um, uh, took back the apartment, kicked her out, basically left her on the street. You have a contract with Orla Kerwin, don't you? Do me a favour, will you? Use another company. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, action. Give us another bottle of uh, red wine and don't open it. Okay. And uh, the bill, please. Okay, no So you have a great appetite. I don't believe I've ever seen anyone eat 12 different dishes of tapas at one sitting. Well, I haven't eaten all day. Really? Well, it's the old hand and the young hand. Bob is from the outside. He's not a member of the Carrickstown kind of herd. He's not even a member of the Irish herd, in a way. He's been too long away, so he lives on the edge of the herd, on the edge of the society where the crooks and the villains and the conmen and the artists live, incidentally. Um, I was just thinking of uh, doing karate lessons at the centre, and I believe that Zumo here is Carrickstown's answer to Chuck Norris, so I thought I'd pick his brains. You have brains? Keep walking, Fatso. Unless you want to be a spark, too. Hug. With myself and Bob, he has counterfeit money, which he is desperate to get rid of because he's broke at the moment. So he, I, he has a fair few thousand and comes to Zuma looking for help. Do you think you might be able to conduct yourself with a little bit more discretion? A uh, sap like him take the mickey on me? No chance. No one really understands what's going to happen to Zuma, you know, that kind of way. Like, what's he going to do next? I mean, he's so unpredictable. Nobody knows. Well, is he trying to be nice or is he just trying to be like a real tough guy that's gonna take no crap from anyone, you know that kind of way? When Billy died, Carol stepped into his shoes and took over the running of the club. You know, I could take a grand out of that till and have you whacked if I wants. When Billy died, she did become the Black Widow. You know, she took on traits of his, like nobody's gonna mess with me again. She kind of built up her empire. She had a nightclub. She, she learned from him. I meant to bring them up earlier on. The club also becomes the setting for Lorcan and Ali's drug dealing business. We did it. We really did it. I know. Oh, and it wasn't even that hard. She never took drugs, and she wasn't into kind of doing that kind of stuff. She did sell them, you know, and she was involved in importing them. And the way she justified it was, well, if we don't bring them into the country, someone else will. We may as well make the money. That's just the way she thinks. 
When Carol becomes involved with Rory, an undercover cop, the scene is set for a gripping storyline. Go! Lorcan gets out in bail and goes to settle the score with Rory. Uh. <coughs> Wait. I'm a cop. It's okay. I'm a cop. <laughs> when Lorcan died, he would have only been around 21 and he got involved with the wrong people and then he got shot by a man I was involved with who was a police officer, but I didn't know he was a police officer. So they were really heavy scenes to shoot. Uh, number one, I was very sad that Killian was leaving, so it wasn't that hard. Uh, but I think the worst thing that can happen to anybody is to lose a child. It must be the worst thing, I and mean, I don't think there's any greater loss. So. You know, it doesn't matter who you are, or how much you screw up in life, you, you've got to empathise with somebody who has that kind of loss. So even though she was fundamental in his death, you know, to an extent, it's, 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 it, she didn't want him to die, you know, she didn't want, obviously, you know, and it was, she paid for it, it was the biggest price that she could pay for it. No, 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 no. Love is in the air in Carrickstown in 2007. Years after their teenage romance, Suzanne Doyle becomes engaged to Damien. Leo finally marries Lana, and romance blossoms between Ray and Gina. I really couldn't believe it. Like, who would ever put Gina with Ray or Ray with Gina? It was just like, why would, why <laughs> would you do that? What on earth would they see in each other, you know? There was one particularly nice moment, I think, I, I do remember, when uh, he first, they first managed to get to go out together. They got to go out to dinner in a very posh restaurant and Gina was dressed in this glorious very red posh. dress and absolutely looking top notch, you know, and Ray was feeling very uncomfortable. And they were kind of going, like, what do you see in me, kind of, and what do you see in me? And finally, he just sort of said, well, actually, I'm just an ordinary barmaid. Ah, and I'm just an ordinary mechanic. Ah, that's what we see in each other. That's what we are. You don't have to be nervous. Oh, yeah, well, no. Look, I just don't want to give the wrong impression. I'm just an ordinary working class job or an ex-wife and, you know, trying to scrape by, you know, and... Just the same as me. In 2008, we see the final chapter in the love story between Floyd and Heather, when Floyd returns, played by a different actor. Though, of course, no one in Carrickstown notices. Floyd has come back not to reignite the affair, but to tell everybody he's dying. What did you say? Christy, what did you say? I'm asking you a question, Floyd. Please, Renee, let him talk. What's going on, son? That I'm... Um, I'm dying. Floyd came back when he was dying. So Floyd and, uh, and Heather got together. He didn't care at this stage. And absolutely, Renee thought it was the worst possible thing. Matt, can I say something, please? 
Sure. It's quite a heavy story, the kind of Floyd and Heather. I mean, you know, um, brother and sister and ending up having sex. It's, um, it's, uh, for somebody like Bob, he had a very, a very strict moral stance on it. He didn't accept it at all. He thought it was completely unacceptable and it should stop. You are a disgrace. You should be ashamed of yourself. He didn't want to become a burden. He didn't want uh, the family to see him slowly fading away. He didn't want Heather to see him fading away. So he believed that suicide would have been the best option. Can I help you? So he approaches Brandon. Yeah, the guy who hates him. It's not that Dr. Daly was trying to convince Floyd of euthanasia. It was very much that Floyd was convincing the doctor that that's the only way he could go. Fix it up for you. Your mother will kill me if she sees it like this. It's okay. While it was unsaid, when Dr. Daly did come over that evening and brought his case with him, he knew what was going to happen. He said goodbye to his son lying on the couch, and then he went out into the shop to behave as a shopkeeper while Brendan did the deed. And yes, he knew, and he approved of it because he knew it was what his son wanted. Ready? Oh, yeah. He believed that it was the right thing to do as a doctor. And he, he had to put his emotions aside to do that. Christy, why is the door closed? Uh, from the public to Heather and Floyd was 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 huge actually, and it still is. Um, people come up to me and say things like, you know, it's so sad that people in situations can find themselves, you know, the, at loss and hurt and pain. And people went there with them. They so they felt huge compassion and empathy for them. I'd like to ask you to be my, well, to marry me, like. On a happier note, Barry makes a very public proposal to Annette. Don't just stand there, answer the man. <laughs> yes. I would be honored if you would be my wife. Ray? Well, uh, Gina and Ray are tying the knot too, though to complicate things, Gina wants a double wedding with Paul and Neve. My mother, Gina, met and fell in love with Ray, and that was the moment where her mother said, "And let's get married on the same day in the same wedding dress." Neve was marrying Paul in the Catholic Church. Ray and Gina were getting married in the registry office. Let me be the shoulder you lean on, the rock on which you rest. So she's rushing to get to the ceremony where Neve and Paul are getting married so she can walk up the aisle with them. So going ahead without us. Ray, Ray, she's furious. Ray had uh, a little motorbike instead of a limousine with a side carriage. So off they went and Gina was roaring at the traffic sign saying, hurry up, I have to get married. Go on, run, take that hey. thing down and we have to go, hurry up. We're trying to get married, come on. Oh my God, please, please. Barry, is that Barry? Get your hands off me. Barry, the ex fiance so who gave her away, okay. and his drunk of a girlfriend, Annette, were having a bit of a, a domestic in the church. Barry! Barry! Would you shut up for God's sake? You're making a show of us. Annette turns up and she's out of her game and she's totally plastered. So Barry, he gets kind of annoyed, angry, and he grabs her and takes her outside. Can he? I love you. Put your seatbelt on. As they're driving out of the church, in his temper, in comes Ray and Gina. Neve, 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 
needs to walk stuff, stuff. Shh, shh, They're fantastically shh, mad shh, stories. That's what makes soap brilliant. Soap is the only legitimate form of gossip. You can gossip about these characters and not feel guilty at all. <laughs> Weddings in Carrickstown always go awry, and Damien and Suzanne's is no different. Mother of the bride, Rita Doyle, has a stroke. Ma? Ma? Ma! What's happened? Jimmy, she's taking a turn. Damien, get an ambulance! Da! Da! Hey, Rita. So, uh... Now might be a good time to show you the bedroom. Thought you'd never ask. Though not long married to Robin, things are stirring between Jimmy and Ali. You started this. Let's finish it. I am sleeping with her. Me and Ali are together. I wanted to tell you. But how could I? Sleeping with, with Ali Foley. Jimmy eventually runs off to Australia, leaving both of them behind. Look at the state of you. You're nothing but a slut. A cheap slut. I'm proud of who I am. Are you? Go on, go for it. Go over to feelings. Get yourself 20 Mars bars. Just because you'd one husband shot dead, it doesn't mean you can steal somebody else's. You leave my larkin out of this! Where are you going? Not now, Suzanne. Jimmy! I'm out of here! What? I'm done! I've had it! No, there's nothing. Leo's life fell apart when Lana went missing, and it's months later before he discovers the truth and gets his revenge. Even then, she wouldn't give up. So I... hit her a couple of times. Next thing... I got a dead woman in the back of my car. Why did you kill Why? Back! 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 It just happened, Leo. It just happened. No! You're not going anywhere! No! In 2009, Carrickstown celebrates its 100th year. Next, our local guards. Please show them what you think of them. Well, ladies, Yvonne Doyle's love life is getting seriously confusing. While going out with Louis, she has a brief liaison with Paul. You know, you laugh just like Helen. <laughs> but the only thing... You like her in a lot of ways. <laughs> Such as? Here. The smile. The walk. <laughs> a lot of ways. Yvonne then confounds everybody by getting together with a woman called Connie. No, he finds the lesbian story not that hard to swallow. He just wished she told him and coming out the way she did in the middle of the whole community he just sort of went uh you know i mean he didn't charge or saying what the hell are you doing you know this that and the other he just and he listened to the remarks that people were saying and like he told her he said i had to stand there listening to people talking about my daughter and it wasn't very nice it really wasn't very nice and to cap it all yvonne finds out she is pregnant you've got to remember that yvonne had probably had sex with three people in that week louis Paul and Connie. Now we can rule Connie out as being the father for obvious reasons. So yeah, the fan and stuff hitting it could be happening anytime soon. Just as things are going good with Carol and Christy, Renee and Bob arrive back to attend the trial of Brendan Daly for Floyd's murder. Are we recording three, two, one, action? I'm sorry for everything, okay? 
Come on back to Heather's and we can sort this whole mess out. Bob is up against the pin of his collar, as my mother used to say, because he's just found that all of the money that he took back from Bulgaria is all dud. And he was in such a hurry to get out of the country in the recession with cash in his pocket that he didn't notice that it was all fake. And, and he's desperate and, and he has no cash, no money. Um, everything that he owns is turned to, to, to sand. So he's clawing desperately at trying to keep uh, his relationship, which is rocked by this, and trying to get some money to make sure that they can, that Rene and himself can, can get by. I might have... Things are not going well between her and Bob, so Rene turns her attention back to Christy. This afternoon, I'd say we'll have to do it after lunch. I'm going to end up having a very large scrap with Renee, and um, where I end up throwing a cup of coffee over her. <laughs> I put a cup of coffee in her face because uh, she insults my integrity. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do this afternoon. Who are you except Billy Meehan's widow trying to live off a good man? Oh, oh here's coming to chew you. Perhaps you'd mentioned this to Christy the next time she's smiling at him and trying to be ladylike. Get your stuff and clear off out of here, why don't you? Look, Carl, stop on there, right? Your history! Now you deal with it! Yeah. It felt like that when he kissed me. What? No smart comment. All right, Rene, uh, I think you better leave. You said enough. That was exciting. I mean, that was great, you know, and we should have enjoyed it. Yeah, we wanted to get it in one because the coffee was being thrown and we didn't want to keep having to do it and change outfits. And, and <laughs> I do have it. two coats, yeah. though, just in case. Annette never marries Barry. She goes back in the drink and gets involved with McAleer. McAleer saw that she was being neglected by Barry. In a, in a very, very bad way. And, uh, and over a period of six months, inveigled his way into her life and then took her off to America to go to a rehab clinic. And it was there that she meet, met Bill. Why don't you go back to where you came from? There's nothing for you around here. My wife is here. She won't want to see you. Now she knows you're disposed of your other wives. Tough words. But I won't hold them against you. I just don't understand it. Myself and Annette were kidnapped by Bill, and of course he was using her to get to me because he'd already killed three of his past wives. And uh, yeah, Bill Taylor is a seriously dangerous character. Don't you think this has gone far enough? Let's finish it. No! <clears throat> Harry, 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 wait! Harry, Harry, Harry! Will you let me go? I don't even know she's in there! Put the fire brigade on the way! Just wait for them, let them go with Barry, come on, wait! Leave me alone! Barry, Harry, don't do it! Barry, come on, Barry! There's the fire, and Barry does the brave thing and rushes into the fire and he saves Bill. He didn't see Annette, he didn't know that she was there, and it was too late then, there was an explosion and it was all over. Where's Annette? Is she still inside? Take it easy. Is she still in there? Let's take it easy, Barry, will you? Is she? Yes! Barry, the fur gets on its way, will you wait, for God's sake, Barry? Where would you be with the soap without melodrama? Of course, you have to. You have to do it. I mean, it's um, it's 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 great fun to do. It has to have that certain amount of drama. We all know it would never happen in real life, and if it does, I think 
they're living in a soap opera. In Carrickstown, we handle murder, mayhem, incest every day of the week. Nobody's going to be happy in, in, in Fair City for a long time. I mean, if people are happy in Fair City or in any soap, it's quite boring. So you need to have a little bit of spice thrown in every now and again. I am so proud and completely committed to the value that Fair City represents. It provides a lot of employment for crews, cast and writers, and a great deal of satisfaction for Irish audiences. I really enjoy it now because I'm so familiar with her. She's not boring. Stuff happens to her. You know, often it's bad stuff, but it's drama for me as an actress. I think what people tend to forget is that soaps continue, the, the world over, they continue to be the most popular entertainment programmes on any channel. When I first started, I didn't see myself being in it for 14 years, so I'm going to just play it the way I've been playing it so far. I'll just keep picking up the scripts and hoping that I'm in. That's the secret of soap. There's no beginning or end. There's only the middle. I am absolutely so thrilled to be part of Fair City. I mean, I feel very lucky and privileged, to be honest with you. It's the best gig in town.